topics will be engineering materials, codes and standards and uh, review of uh, stresses. Engineering materials, so engineering materials are uh, defined as solid substances which are being manufactured for the various applications. So this is the broad classification of engineering materials. Engineering materials is uh, classified accordingly the content, uh, iron content. If the materials which uh, contains iron, it is uh, termed as ferrous and which do not contain iron, which is termed as non-ferrous. Then under ferrous, again we have a sub-classification that depends on the composition of iron as well as the carbon, cast iron and steel. Then uh, under non-ferrous, we have so many non-ferrous uh, materials. For the classification, I have taken only four, aluminum, copper, magnesium and zinc. Then apart from these, uh, we have uh, plastics, composites, uh, ceramics so and so. So there are various uh, engineering materials are there. Then some of the properties we can discuss about these uh, engineering materials are elasticity, plasticity, brittleness, ductility, malleability, hardness, strength and toughness. These are all some of the engineering properties of the materials. So coming to the first property, elasticity, if any member is subjected to load, obviously that member is going to undergo some deformation and if you take out the load, when you take out the load, if the member can able to uh, gain its uh, original shape and size, regain its original shape and size, then that particular ability of a material is called as elasticity. Okay? It is elastic in nature if it is can able to regain its original shape and size. Then when the load is applied, if it underscore deformation, then if you take out the load, if that material cannot able to regain its original shape and size, if it underscore undergo deformation permanently or plastically, then it is called as plasticity. The ability of a material which do not regain its original shape and size is called as plasticity, brittleness. So if you apply load, it, it will uh, take the load or sustain the load for some amount of time and if you increase the load, it is going to deform without any significant deformation. You will not find any significant deformation in, this, in the case of brittleness. It will not going to deform, but it will going to fracture directly. That is what brittleness. Then the ductility. So the ability of a material to um, elongate more or uh, the property by virtue of it, you can able to, uh, it can be drawn out of thin wires, it is called as a ductility. Then the property by virtue of it, it can be drawn out of thin sheets, it is called as malleability. Then hardness is the ability of a materials to with, withstand the wear or the abrasion on the surface, it is the hardness property. Then strength is nothing but uh, the amount of load it can sustain before fracture or until the fracture how how much the load it can take that is what the strength of the material then the toughness is the amount of energy it can absorb before energy fracture that is what the toughness so these are all some of the properties of the material then moving on to the next topic standards and codes standards is uh, defined as a set of specific a set of specifications for parts, materials and process. Codes, <coughs> the definition of the code is a set of analysis for design, manufacturing, testing, construction of product. So if you just look, on, look into the difference, standards is uh, specified for the materials or the parts. Codes is specified for the process. Okay. So here the main purpose of the standards is to bring the uniformity, bring the uniformity and uh, the efficiency or the uh, <coughs> interchangeability of the parts. Interchangeability means suppose uh, if any parts of any machine is going to damage, then you are going to, uh, you will be in a position to select the part in the market, you will find some n number of parts, it is manufactured by different uh, companies. So if all the companies are 
prepared or manufactured that particular part using the same code, same standard, then you can take any of the part and you can fit into that particular machine. That is what the interchangeability. And also the standards is uh, set to have some control over the inventory because there should be some limit for the production of the parts. The production of the parts should not be more than the demand. Demand and supply should be balanced. That is what the intention of the standards. There are so many standards are available like international uh, standard of organization, ISO, BIS, Bureau of Indian Standard, then uh, ASME uh, and ASM and so on. There are so many standards are there where standards are set by some of the organization. Okay. Then coming to the codes, codes will be set by the government or uh, the local bodies where the codes are defined for the construction. The purpose of the code is to set minimum acceptable level. Say for example, if you want to construct a building, then you need to prepare the concrete. There is certain ratio about which you need to prepare the concrete. Otherwise, you will, if you violate the rule, then you will find some of the cracks in the constructed building after one year or two years and so on. So you need to go with proper code, set of code. It is specified by the government to uh, ensure the quality. So the next topic under discussion is a review of stresses. Before getting into the discussion about the stresses, it is essential to know about the loads because we all know that uh, the stress is directly proportional to the load. So coming to the load, the definition of load is uh, a load is an external agent which changes or tends to change the uniform motion or state of rest of a body. So this is the complete definition of the load. So if you just uh, review the definition of the load, it is an external agent. So we need to apply the load externally. Therefore, it is essential to know about the load because uh, the type of load decides about the type of stress developed. Okay. So load is an external agent which changes, changes or tends to change. It will create the tendency in a body to change the state of rest or uh, uniform motion of a body. So state of rest and the uniform motion of a body is uh, the state. If a body continues to be in the state of rest or if a body continues to be in the state of motion, then it is called as inertia force, inertia of a body. So here the definition goes like a external agent changes the inertia or tends to change the inertia is called as uh, force. So anything which disturbs the inertia of a body, we can call it as force or the load because load and force are not the same. Under load, we have moment also. Load is classified into force as well as moment. That is why we have equilibrium equation like uh, Fx, sum of all the horizontal forces is equal to zero. Fy, sum of all the vertical forces is equal to zero. Then moment is equal to zero summation all the moment is equal to zero. So moment also comes under load. Moment can also able to change the uniform motion or state of rest of a body. Okay. Then the characteristics of a load. There are four characteristics of a load. <coughs> First one is uh, the magnitude of the load, then the direction of the load, then point of application of the load and the sense of the load. So you are going to specify the load with respect to all these four. Out of this, magnitude defines the amount of load to be applied on the material or the quantity of load to be applied on the material. Say for example, 50 kilo Newton or 60 kilo Newton, something like this. Here, the number 60 or 50 represents the amount or the quantity of load to be applied. It is the scalar quantity. It is only having the magnitude. Okay. Then the direction, coming to the direction, we have three different direction, x axis, y as well as z. If you are applying load along x axis, 
it is called as fx. If you are applying load along y axis, it is called as fy. And if you are applying load along z axis, it is called as fz. Like that, it is the direction or the line of application of the load horizontally or vertically. Okay, that is what the direction, line of application. Then the point of application means uh, exact point on the member where you are going to apply the load. That is what the point of application. Then the sense is the arrow mark you are going to use in the while writing the stresses. Okay, how this defines the stresses? We'll look into that one. Magnitude it only specifies the amount. Coming to the direction, Fx, look at here. In this case, axial stress, the load F is acted along the axis. Along the axis, that is axially or longitudinally. <coughs> and therefore, this particular stress is called as axial stress because load is acted axially. And stress is uh, usually denoted by sigma. That will be is equal to F that is the load divided by area. Stress is not defined uh, directly like F by A, force by area. The original definition of the stress being uh, the resistant force offered by the body to the applied load. So it should be resisting force per unit area. Since uh, we know that action and reactions are equal, resisting force will be equal to the applied load. Therefore we are going to write F by A, force by area or the load by area. Okay. So here the load is applied axially in uh, Fx direction, in only one direction. Therefore, it is called as axial stress. Then coming to the sense, if you change the arrow mark, like here the arrow mark is something like this. It is uh, pulling the member. Look at both sides. It is pulling the member. Therefore, this type of stress is called as tensile stress, okay, since it is pulling it. If I change this particular arrow mark and if I write it something like this, then what is the action? The action is pushing. So this particular forces along both sides is pushing the member or compressing the member. Therefore, the stress developed in this particular type of loading is called as compressive stress. So under axial stress, we will come across two different uh, stresses, tensile and compressive. Tensile stress and compressive, depending on the sense of the load. Okay. Then coming to the bending stress, if I change the line of application or uh, line of application, something like this, if I write the member like this, axis then if I apply load perpendicular to it, if I apply load perpendicular to the axis of the member in Fy direction, something like this, then the member is going to bend. Okay, The axis is going to deflect. Therefore, the effect of bending is called as deflection. Fine. So in this case, the bending equation is written as m by i is equal to e by r is equal to sigma by I, sorry, sigma by y. Okay, so this is the general bending equation. So depending on the direction, we can uh, uh, classify stress into longitudinal or transverse bending as well as axial stress. Something like this. Look at here. If I take the member like this, if I hold it on one side, and if I apply load along the axis something like this, then it is axial stress. Then if I apply load perpendicular to it, it is having the bending effect, therefore it is bending stress. Look at the point of application. I am applying the load at the center. In both the cases, I am applying the load at the center. Okay. Now coming to the third case, point of application, I am going to change the point of application. Instead of applying the load at the center like this, I am going to change the point, something like this. I am going to apply load at the end, at some eccentricity. Then what will happen if I apply load something like this? This member is going to twist. This member is going to twist something like this. Okay, the effect is going to change. So if you change the point of application, 
then the effect will be shear. Then the stress developed in the member will be shear stress, where shear stress is defined as force into perpendicular uh, distance, perpendicular distance that is uh, F into R, that is the torque. Torque is the cause for the shear stress. Torque is also a load which is the cause for the shear stress. That is one type of stress. Then when the member is uh, applied, uh, when the member is subjected to load tangentially, okay, so are used and it is subjected to tangential force. If you consider only two different forces here and here, this member is going to fail at this particular point. This member is going to fail at this particular point because of the shear, because this particular area of the rivet will be under shear, will be under the uh, tangential load. Okay. Similarly, this particular member is going to fail. The rivet on this particular member will be fail at this particular point as well as at this particular point. It is called as double shear because at two different points it will be under shear. This particular shear is uh, because of the effect of these two forces and this particular shear is because of this force as well as this one. Okay. So shear we are going to represent it by tau shear again since it is axial load look at here this is the axis of the member this is the axis of the member this since this is the axial load it is uh, written by f in f by a only shear stress is equal to shear force by area and in this particular case since this is undergoing twist or the torque the general torsion equation is given by t by j is equal to tau by r is equal to g theta by l Okay, so this is the uh, review of the stresses. In this particular equation, bending stress equation, M is nothing but bending moment, which is uh, denoted by Newton millimeter. I is nothing but uh, moment of inertia, denoted by millimeter to the power 4. <coughs> e is the Young's modulus of the material, it is denoted by Newton per mm square. R is the radius of curvature denoted by millimeter. Sigma is the bending stress denoted by Newton per mm square. And Y is the distance from neutral axis to the outermost fiber, either inner or outer. From this point, since it is uh, the stress along this particular point is zero, it is called as neutral axis. From this point to this point or this point to this point, the distance, these two are called as Y. Similarly, in the general torsion equation, T is nothing but uh, torque or torsional moment. It is denoted by Newton millimeter. J is the polar moment of inertia. Again, it is denoted by millimeter to the power uh, 4. Tau is uh, the shear stress denoted by Newton per mm square. R is the radius of the shaft, this one radius of the shaft or the radius of the circular member is denoted by mm. G is the rigidity modulus. It is it's the property of the material, rigidity modulus. It is denoted by Newton per mm square. Theta is the angle of twist. It is denoted by, usually it is denoted by degrees, but we will be converting it into radians. Then L is the length of the member or length of the shaft. It is denoted by L. So this is about the review of the stresses. Okay, so when a member is subjected to load in any one of the direction, then the stress developed in the member is called as simple stress. Okay, so if a member is subjected to axial load, it is axial stress, tension or uh, compression. If a member is subjected to transverse load, it is bending stress. And if a member is subjected to eccentric load, then shear stress comes into picture. So these are all simple stresses because of the simple loading condition. But in most of the cases, uh, many of the machine components will be under uh, compound uh, loading condition in the physical working conditions. Okay. Therefore, it is essential to uh, extend our discussion on the stresses uh, whenever the member is subjected to compound loading condition. Okay. So whenever the member is subjected to compound loading condition, we will come across uh, these type of stresses, principal stress and principal planes, under which we have uniaxial state of stress, 
It is only taken for the example. And uh, plane stress uh, system, this is what we require actually. And about uh, uh, using these particular equations, we need to solve the problems for its dimensions. OK, we will begin our discussion on uh, the principal plane and principal stress. Whenever his member is uh, subjected to compound loading condition like uh, axial and uh, shear, axial and torsion, uh, sorry, axial and bending, something like this. Look at here. Whenever a member is subjected to axial and bending, whenever a member is subjected to axial and shear, whenever a member is subjected to bending and shear, there are so many combinations. You can combine in any of the ways. So whenever a member is subjected to compound loading condition, something like this, you need to split and you need to consider the effect of individual load on the member, then you need to club. Say for example, if you take the first case, uh, first you are going to solve this problem using considering only the axial case, axial load, you are going to calculate sigma x, axial stress, then you are going to consider the second uh, load bending where you are going to calculate uh, sigma y then these two sigma x and sigma y you are going to club in this particular equation sigma x sigma y phi and all okay similarly this one you are going to consider this particular load individually separately calculate the stress developed because of this particular load then consider this particular uh, load separately without considering this one calculate the stress developed, then club those two individual stresses in the principal stress. That is what you are going to do to uh, calculate the principal stresses in this particular fashion. We have to select an inclined plane because uh, if you select a perpendicular plane, that will be for the simple loading condition because if you uh, substitute phi is equal to 0, if the phi is 0, inclined plane becomes the vertical plane. If vertical plane you are going to consider for the calculation of the stresses, that particular stress is called as axial stress. But our intention is to calculate the principal stress. Okay. So we need to consider an inclined plane, the effect of both the combined loading. Okay. The effect of both the combined loading will be calculated using the inclined plane. Therefore, we have considered the inclined plane, the inclined plane AB. So the stresses on the inclined plane AB will be one, will be the stress normal to the inclined plane, perpendicular to the inclined plane and one more stress, shear stress will be parallel to the inclined plane. So on all the inclined plane you will find one stress perpendicular and one stress parallel. Okay, This is the normal stress and this is the shear stress. Normal stress and shear, these are all the equations which will be available in the data handbook. Then in the case of uh, plane stress system, look at the difference between these two. Here it is only subjected to axial loading, therefore it is uniaxial and in this case it is subjected to stress in uh, two different directions, sigma x and sigma y along with it is subjected to shear. So this is the case of uh, a member subjected to axial bending as well as uh, something like this shear. Okay. So when this is the case, if you consider an inclined plane, on the inclined plane you will find normal stress and shear stress something like this, inclined stress, uh, normal stress and shear stress. So these are all the formula corresponding to this particular stress system that you will find it in the data handbook. So here, sigma x is the stress corresponding to the individual loading without considering other load. Similarly, tau, oh, where is tau? Okay, tau in the principal stress is related to the shear load or the torque applied on the member without considering the axial stresses. So like this you need to calculate the other dimension by considering individual loads at a time without considering the other forces. Okay, Starting from this particular vertical plane to the horizontal plane, you will find n number of inclined planes something like this, n number of inclined plane and on all the inclined plane you will find normal stress as well as shear stress one stress perpendicular to the inclined plane, one stress parallel to the inclined plane. So you will find n number of sigma n and n number of tau xy. On any one of the inclined plane, you will find shear stress equal to 0. On that particular plane, if you calculate the 
normal stress, that will be the maximum and that particular shear stress on a plane where the shear stress is zero, that particular stress is called as principal stress. So principal stress is the stress on the principal plane. Principal plane is the plane, inclined plane on which the shear stress is zero. So shear st principal stress one and two. So principal stress one is the maximum principal stress, principal stress two is the minimum principal stress. So in this formula if you use plus then it is maximum principal stress sigma 1. In this formula if you use minus then it is the minimum principal stress that is sigma 2. Similarly you will find one particular uh, uh, inclined plane where the shear stress will be more that particular shear stress is denoted by like this. So it is plus or minus plus maximum minus minimum principal shear stress. 